painting, keep repeating to yourself, it's only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie. Britain, in the early 80s, had its fair share of social ills. Rising unemployment, budget cuts, riots, strikes, war. But a new threat was lurking around the corner, which, according to some, would invade our homes, corrupt our children, and attack the moral fabric of our society. There was quite a high level of unemployment. People made redundant from businesses that were closing down, factories that were shutting down, mines that were closing down, used very often their severance money to start up as a video shop. Uh, anybody could do it. It didn't have any particular expertise. And so a large number of people that had never had anything to do with the film business or were coming together, and the one was supplying the other. And it was uh, huge, absolutely mammoth. Um, the, the, the growth was 1,000% overnight. Every week, new films from around the globe would hit the video shelves. New labels rapidly emerged to meet the growing demand for home entertainment. Uh, people were coming in with uh, briefcases full of cash. Uh, they want to open a video store, 20,000, 10,000, whatever it was. You, you give me films. Because whatever we had at that time, people were renting. We were doing so well at the beginning, we were charging £50 per head membership. The members of the public like any type of film there was at the time, and I was doing very well. I don't know what type of film it was, whether it was a horror, action, comedy, children or what. It all went very well. Britain is in the forefront of the video revolution. We have more video recorders per person than any other country in the world. More movies are now seen on video than in the cinema. And this transformed the way in which the British public got access to filmed entertainment. Until that time, the only films they saw were those that had been accepted and subject to voluntary censorship in the cinemas, or which they saw having been televised by the BBC or one or other of the ITV companies. The majors weren't particularly in it at that point. I mean, when I first started, there were 20 films from Warner Brothers and CIC at about 20. And it took a long time for them to adjust to it. And now all of a sudden, those, if I use the term responsible uh, distributors, found themselves in competition with others, uh, small time people very often, with limited resources, most of them not British, uh, who had made, for various reasons, films of a much more extreme nature and who were only too keen to find a British market for them. Ladies and gentlemen, the bloodiest thing that ever happened in front of a camera, snuff. A film that could only be made in South America where life is cheap. People were actually uh, looking for something that they had never seen. I mean, the only horror films that they were actually seeing in cinemas was like the Draculas and uh, very, very mild type of Christopher Lee or uh, Vincent Price type of movies. There was nothing like. The idea of people being able to rent or buy videos which they could show in the home totally outside any of the arrangements that, for instance, restricted what people could see at the cinema was, uh, to some people, a rather shocking thing. It was a journalistic term coined by, I believe, a journalist called Peter Chippendale, who wrote a review of a video trade fair in Manchester either in late 81 or 82 um, in the Sunday Times. A very long account of the kinds of things that were available at this trade fair, which he described as video nasties. There used to be a show called The Penta Show, and it used to be every about six months, I seem to recollect. It was like a great big bazaar. I remember going to see Mike Lee, and uh, he had uh, zombie flesh eaters, and he took great pleasure in showing everybody the woman's face being dragged towards the shard of wood from the broken window and what happens when it goes into the eye, uh, which was cut for the X film at the cinemas, but because there was no law, he uh, said, we're going to put this out, the strong uncut version. <laughs> there was an enormous appetite for movies, and you know, the more salacious and the more sexy and the more... No, no not that. It's time you started thinking. 
faces of death. The driller killer is coming, 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 coming. And the Evil Dead was such a hit. It was the biggest video hit of its time, of its year. I think it sold 50,000 copies in one year, which it sells through, which was, I think, between 40 and 50 pounds at the time, it was a two million pound grossing video. Video, as I say, boomed so big so quickly that when it was this sort of annoying little thing, what, you know, sort of like, you know, it was just like, oh, it will go away. Oh, it's just, it doesn't matter. Who cares? It's just a bunch of perverts. And suddenly when Evil Dead hit so big and suddenly the cinema chain's going, whoa, what's happening here? Of the big distributors, their anxiety was that their image and the image of the industry that they felt they had created for what I call the orthodox mainstream material was going to be contaminated by being associated literally on the shelves of retailers. You would find Mary Poppins next to Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the people who produced Mary Poppins weren't too happy with that juxtaposition. Without recognizable titles or big stars, the independents would rely on sensational packaging to attract the consumer. Well, in those days, I mean, it was a shop tactics to, to advertise the product. So the advertising was a bit over the top for a, a lot of the films. But when you've got a product and you wish to sell it, then you push it to the public. The, the famous packaging for Driller Killer, Cannibal Holocaust. Like I say, I don't think anybody thought they were putting out video nasties. They were just putting out commercial movies. The video industry does have some blame to take here for mounting advertising campaigns, which I think were absolutely inviting the moral busybodies to get busy. Mary Whitehouse, a tireless campaigner, formed the National Viewers and Listeners Association in 1963 and vowed to clean up television. By 1980, the association had 30,000 members. The video nasties would give White House a new crusade. Mary Whitehouse was one of the most uh, astute and effective political organisers we've had in this country, actually. She was a brilliant organiser. Her skill was in articulating it and pointing it all in the, uh, in, in the same direction and hitting one target, which was uh, violence and sex uh, on, on videos. And it was a, an open target, an easy one to attack, and she did it brilliantly. The British public, the vast majority of whom, very understandably, don't know just how... Uh, serious a threat, particularly to the young, the video nasties present. What was becoming clear was that the law simply wasn't coping with the mass explosion of, of, of the material that was available, much of which was extremely violent, uh, extremely obscene, uh, and, um, you know, the law just wasn't dealing with it. Well, it tears. It's, it's an orgy of terror. <laughs> It's the blood bloody apes. Britain has the highest proportion of domestic video recorders in the world. And the fear of the protesters has been that obscene videos might fall into the hands of children. Certainly the titles of the works themselves are a catalogue of depravity. Cannibal Holocaust. SS Experiment Camp. I Spit on Your Grave. The battle, if we can put it that way, in which we're involved is a battle... It's, it's, it's a battle for the whole... I was going to say, I'm tempted to say the soul of the nation, that, that's not for me, but for the whole quality of our culture. I liked Mary Whitehouse. She was a nice lady, but she was a religious lady, and she had every right to say exactly what she thought about films which were, she thought were immoral. What I resented was the fact that it was very difficult to mount a counter-campaign to that. And in fact, in the end, the counter-campaign wasn't so much saying she's talking rubbish as saying she was a foolish old lady and laughing at her. But it is a problem. Liberals don't actually get together and fight anything like as well as the other side. The Daily Mail took up the cause. They ran a campaign to ban the sadist videos, sensationally claiming that video nasties were raping our children's minds. I think that it's a quite a legitimate role uh, for a newspaper to conduct, rather than sort of push it aside and not concentrate uh, on an area of influence that I think is enormous. 
Other national papers were quick to jump on the bandwagon. Certain broadsheet newspapers, like the Times and the Telegraph, were just as guilty of whipping up these stories as, you know, papers like the Sun and uh, and and the Mail. Well, I think what 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 the press stands to gain from whipping up these stories is it kind of a in a completely hypocritical way, it helps sell newspapers. You can have pages and pages and pages talking about the horrors that are in all these videos and you know, appealing to people's rather prurient senses here. And then at the end of it all, it says, oh, and of course we must ban these uh, video nasties, um, having entertained people for pages and pages with details of what's apparently in them. But also I think it plays to these papers' thoroughly populist and uh, right-wing agendas. You know, papers like the Mail are always going on about the end of life as uh, we know it, and uh, you know, society is in a terrible state of moral decay. And what we need, you know, is strong moral leadership. Bring on Margaret Thatcher. The moralist cause maintained that the video shop was not a hub of family entertainment, but a haven of violent filth. Margaret Thatcher and Mary Whitehouse shared similar views on the sanctity of family and the home. Margaret Thatcher would have um, looked on, on Mary Whitehouse favourably in representing these, these sort of conservative, cautious values. I think she resonated quite well, I would have thought, with decent people like that, you see. Well, undoubtedly, um, um, Mrs Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister, uh, listened uh, to what, what we were saying. So the headlines hit the reader and made him feel that there were no longer any problems such as uh, their wage packets or whether the hospital was working. The cause of all their problems was video nasties. <laughs> What is a video nasty? Difficult to define. Um, they are being steadily classified, but it's any film, I mean, it happens to be on a video, but it's a film that includes violence, sadism, uh, horror, you know, you, you know, the sort of, of horror films that we, we used to call horror aren't nearly as, they were mild compared with some of these. Things like Killer Driller, horrible titles they've got. According to the media, the video nasty was a new low in sick entertainment. Even the adult industry was keen to distance itself. The sex shop that sells sex videos. It's things like Driller Killer and the nasty videos, nothing to do with sex. They're mainly violence, etc. So we don't have anything to do with those. Operating without regulation or censorship, the video industry threatened good and decent society. The problem was, of course, children. And lots of people led, uh, leapt into the argument to say that if people had uh, violent or uh, dirty videos, kids would have access. People like Mary Whitehouse was saying that people like myself were serving children, underage children, 10, 15 year olds with murderous type films. Rubbish. It's almost as though the um, video nasty has replaced the conjurer and the party games at parties. It's just stupid, really, though. I thought, Mum, it's not that scary. What about stuff like the living dead and zombie flesh yeah, eaters and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, they're good. Nah, they're, they're stupid. They're not realistic, <laughs> are they? My mum don't really let me, but I watch them when she's not in. The first thing is it desensitises the child to violence. Then they start to enjoy it. And that's worrying, the pow wallop, they enjoy that. And the third bit, and I think that's the most important, is that they develop an appetite for it. Me, I prefer horror films. Why is that? Because they're more scary. The adults' right to choose their own entertainment was of no concern to the moral crusaders. The purity of our children's minds was at stake. And I'm afraid, you know, people who say, but why shouldn't adults be able to see this kind of thing in their own home? I I'm half tempted to say that people who make that kind of demand, knowing that children are likely to see it, aren't really themselves very mature and adult. And I had many confrontations with Mary Whitehouse once on television in regard to what she classifies as video nasties. Um, I mean, in my young days, I used to enjoy watching a good Western film, but it never made me ever want to go out and start scalping people. It is hard to 
conceive of images harming people. I think you can conceive of images upsetting people or disturbing people or arousing people or even making them laugh. But the idea of images actually harming people or through harming people, harming society, seems to me to be akin to the kind of medieval notion of witchcraft, I have to say. It has a copycat effect, and I'm afraid some t try and work out what they've seen in real life. Not only is there the question of people who will copy what they see, and I, I would be the first to admit that's only going to be a minority of people, but what's the effect of, of it upon us all? I mean, if you sit in your easy chair, supping your, your, you know, your tea or whatever it may be, your chips and your beans and everything else, and with that, taking in a diet of violence, so you cease to be shocked. Then you had uh, the legal profession, who were often uh, using the excuse of exposure to video nasties, as they were becoming known, as the reason why their client had committed a particular crime and judges often accepted that. And when these cases were reported, that added fuel to the fire. The problem is that there you have all this research, and not only research, common sense, which says that people do imitate what they see. That's what bringing up children is all about. I mean, she does quote, um, you know, people saying that <clears throat> the evidence is overwhelming, that um, uh, media violence is ca causes harm and so on. Um, but there is very little in it, indeed, that um, um, one could uh, point to as being part of any sort of academic analysis. It's extremely unlikely that desensitization to watching f violent films could be the cause of anyone going out and committing uh, violence on the streets. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Coggan, who's just sat through some of the worst nasties himself, says he's appalled and warns parents... Watch very, very carefully, because the results on the life of the child and through that child later on society may be far greater than most of us think. You know, we have our own views and, and there is a considerable amount of research on the effects of, of horror, uh, whether it introduces nightmares or desensitizes or leads to imitation and so on and so forth. But they were not important in the debate. It was simply, these are gross images from which we should protect our children. <laughs> What have you watched? I watched zombies. And what happens in that one? All the zombies running about and killing people and all blood splurting out of their heads. You see a lot of people getting their heads chopped off and slaughtered all over the place. She speared his head, she threw a spear through his head and... and... Didn't that frighten you? Yes. I have never seen a video nasty. I wouldn't. I have far too much. But how, how can you judge on a video now? Oh, have you never seen one? Look, if somebody tells me, as we get these reports in from Europe, from America, and from this country, that a particular video nasty contains that, 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 and that, I actually don't need to see visually what I know is in that film. I mean, I still get, oh, well, have you seen it? Well, you know, how can you criticize anything you haven't seen? And then you say, well, yeah, I did actually see it. Oh, so it's OK for you to see it, but you want to stop everybody else seeing it. So we can't win either way. I've seen some parts of them uh, because I've had to. Uh, I don't dwell on it because I think the imagery is, is pretty sickening. Answering that specific criticism, if you didn't see something, you can't criticise them. You know, does a doctor have to have cancer in order to diagnose cancer in a patient? Of course not. Increasing public concern about the proliferation of these kinds of videos has been fueled by a powerful press campaign. The police were urged to act, but what exactly was the crime being committed? I arrived in the Obscene Publications branch in 1981, and I think within a few months of me being there, we found that there was an explosion uh, within the media uh, from outside agencies telling us of certain videos that were coming into the country 
which were totally obscene. I led the campaign to bring films into the Obscene Publications Act because it's a test of harm, of harmful influence. It's not a test of what is offensive to the man in the Clapham omnibus, which we'd had before. And I don't think anything should be banned on grounds of offensiveness. It should only be banned on grounds of harm. Because obscenity is quite a difficult, difficult test. Um, you know, how do you prove that something is, depraved and is depraving and corrupting? It's quite difficult. From my point of view, uh, I didn't know anything at all about videos. Uh, I don't think any of my staff, and I had 12 officers, knew anything about video. Driller Killer was the, the, one of the principal ones. I Spit on Your Grave, Cannibal Holocaust, uh, were three that were imprinted on my mind, that were the first three that were brought to my attention through the media. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we got copies, saw those copies, and I marched over to the Director of Public Prosecutions. The DPP's reaction was, uh, I'm giving my authority for you to go to a court to apply for a warrant under the Obscene Publications Act. Police forces up and down the country could now seize any video which they thought may be obscene. With over 15,000 video shops in England alone, they had their work cut out. Surely we're talking about a tiny, tiny minority of sort of pornographic merchants, aren't we? We're not talking about ordinary traders and big companies. No, please, I'm not talking of pornography at all. In none of these videos is there any form of pornography. They only relate to violence. Consequently, police started to raid retailers and wholesalers and distributors alike, with no clear-cut definition of what they were looking for. There we are, we go down to Thorny EMI, who were flabbergasted that the, the Obscene Publications branch of Scotland Yard come along. And I was known as Mr Video Nasty with it, all these people there. Are otherwise respectable companies getting involved in this? Oh, yes, I'm afraid so. We have public companies involved in it. Major public companies? Yes, we have Thorny MI, Intervision. Good Lord, what... I feel every company was in a great dilemma uh, as a result of my arrival. What do they do? Distributors and retailers had no more idea than the police which of their films were obscene. The director of public prosecutions started issuing lists, but police enforcement varied from county to county, and titles would be added and dropped from the list without notice. The logical course of events should have been that the director of public prosecutions should have seen the films prior to release and then issued instructions to the police forces, but it, they didn't. The police who decided to prosecute the nasties weren't what the censors would call very film literate. They didn't know, actually know much about movies. So various embarrassing cases came up. They confiscated Apocalypse Now, thinking that it was a nasty called Cannibal Apocalypse. They confiscated The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, a rather anodyne musical. They also went after a film called The Big Red One, presumably thinking it was a pornographic film. In fact, it was a film from Sam Fuller about his old Second War Battalion. After visiting my shop and taking 20 films from my library, I took myself and my wife to my home to see if I had any films at home of any special type. I was then taken down to the local police station and placed on bail, of all things, while they investigate my films. They took about four to 5,000 videos away, which was probably the entire products on the shelves at that point in time. So they didn't come looking for specifically, they just took everything and then took them away and probably had parties to watch them. They took the three directors uh, and the junior buyer, who was a teenager, and then came back uh, threatening, saying that you could be charged under Section 2 and Section 3, which we subsequently were. This, obviously, <laughs> was quite serious because that carried fines of up to £20,000 and you could get up to two years in prison. Distributors and retailers alike were charged under the Obscene Publications Act and called to trial. Well, we were all very nervous at the time because people were being sent down for, 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 for a lot less, you know, just for the fact that they, uh, they were frightened, didn't defend, didn't fight, and uh, they were easy targets. And despite the fact it was a farce, um, I really didn't fancy doing two years in strange ways. <laughs> I think I lost two stone in weight and 
not knowing uh, one particular day whether I was going to go to court and be acquitted or go to go to jail. And so we were in front of the stipendiary magistrate, Richard Ducan defending or asking questions, the magistrate, and Police Chief Anderson's prosecution. And Ducan requested from the prosecution, he said, could you please tell me how many cases in the Greater Manchester area the police have investigated since 1982 of people being attacked by flesh-eating zombies? They did show two of the films in court. I can't remember which two they were, but uh, and and the jury were hysterical. They they really loved them, <laughs> which, which was which was very good for my defence. In court, a solicitor for the director of public prosecutions called the material an extravaganza of gory violence, capable of depraving and corrupting those who watched it. Court cases up and down the land were only adding to the confusion. In one court, a film may be condemned as obscene, but in another, found not obscene. Some defenders were fined or even jailed. Others were acquitted. A number of film titles were convicted of being obscene, but many weren't. Many juries, many magistrates decided that video nasties weren't as harmful as Mary Whitehouse seemed to think. I was trying to abide by uh, what I consider to be right in the industry and uh, it shouldn't continue like that and uh, a message got back to me that we would not be bothered by the police again but uh, lo and behold uh, the police came in uh, because at that time we, we there was a company in our, on our premises Palace Virgin Gold and they had a title called Evil Dead. <laughs> I think my partner Nick um, really put himself on the line by testifying for the film. We hired lawyers and we, we took it to court. We basically wanted it to, for it to be tried with a judge and jury. Unfortunately for the government, the jury decided that the evil dead wasn't guilty of obscenity. So the government's program, its campaign against, un, against the nasties was unravelling. Not all distributors were so lucky. David Hamilton Grant, World of Video 2000, released an Italian splatter movie, Nightmare. Grant retitled the film Nightmares in a Damaged Brain and promoted it with a tasteful Guess the Weight of the Human Brain competition. Before long, the police paid him a visit. I was cross-examined by the prosecution. Who goes to watch these films? Um, why don't you think they're harmful? Particularly harmful to anybody. Uh, if you don't like to see masses of blood, you don't go to that sort of film. I can't remember it, but this is what I said. Not a classic, but well executed. Provoking the testy retort from the judge, which I can scarcely believe. So was the German invasion of Poland. Well, if you get judges like that, you do know you've reached the end of the line, really. Grant was sentenced to 18 months in jail for supplying obscene material for the purpose of gain. The David Hamilton Grant verdict increased the uncertainty and confusion within the industry, and measures would have to be taken to restore order. The DPP's list of banned nasties reached as high as 79 at one point, but ultimately settled at 39 in December 1985. Films by Dario Argento, Wes Craven, Abel Ferrara and Sam Raimi sat alongside the likes of the Gestapo's last orgy and Faces of Death. The filmmakers responsible for the depravity were not called upon to testify. But it was their work that was the cause of the hysteria. Io molto a stima per gli inglesi, per la loro democrazia, per la loro serietà. Beh, la censura non è democrazia. Che siamo tutti ragazzini, non ho capito, sono tutti stupidi. So you kind of know that there must be people that censor these things. There are certain things you're not supposed to show. And all sorts of mythologies are concocted to enforce that, you know, that this is going to be harmful to children or this is, I don't know what, but I think it's really there are certain truths that are so painful and, and ugly that uh, people don't like them to be aired. 
guardavamo la televisione spesso in quel periodo e mio figlio, che allora aveva solo sette anni, si lamentava del telegiornale delle, delle 20 perché riportava sempre morti dei, dei brigatisti rossi, era un periodo molto... Ho, ho cercato di, di, di renderla abbastanza dura come immagini assolutamente erano per i ragazzi. Erano forti, però la vita è forte. Una delle cose interessanti che il film fa è mostrare kind of how sexuality can be perverted into violence and it's ugly, it's horribly ugly. I would hope that somebody would see that and say, oh my God, I hope I never ever do anything approaching that. Naturalmente la politica c'entra il 99% perché fa scena, no? Tutte queste imprese roboanti fanno scena. La politica deve essere veduta, deve essere letta, deve essere sentita. Se sta zitta, chi se ne accorge? Era, era il sistema che introdusse un governante inglese che si chiamava Margaret Thatcher. Introdusse lei questa, questa censura così violenta contro i film. E la Thatcher, se è stata lei a pensare una cosa del genere, ha fatto violenza ai suoi nemici perché ha mandato a combattere gli inglesi dall'altra parte dell'America e non ha fatto ammazzare la gente. Non so violenze, la Thatcher. Allora è meglio il film mio o mandare una nave giù a sparare contro gli argentini? C'è che se il nostro film, a qua sa, a qua sa. A qua sa la morte. E che se parce che c'è un puritanisme vieillo, eredé du cristianisme. Io vado in, spessissimo in Inghilterra, meno male che non mi hanno mai chiesto un passaporto, non so c'è il pericolo che mi fermavano, ma che stavano come autore di, di cassa, chissà che cosa. Chiederò, scriverò all'ambasciata inglese. I produced a, uh, a small video of extracts from uh, four videos. In the end, I took it to the House of Commons, I took it to the House of Lords, I took it to Strasbourg. Firstly, can I ask you what was the MP's reactions to what you showed them? I think they were horrified by what they saw. What sort of things, what sort of clips were you showing them? Well, the three clips, or, or there's an extract of six clips, uh, Driller Killer, Snuff, uh, I Spit on Your Grave, Faces of Death. So in the House of Commons, we actually saw people eating live monkeys' brains. The, the, this is absolutely true, you may laugh. <laughs> but, but, but that is, that's just a moment, right. just, just, just a sure. The video yeah. industry was keen to clean up its image in the wake of the video nasty scandal. With the blessing of the government, the British Video Association, in conjunction with the British Board of Film Censors, set about establishing a definitive system of self-regulation. The government, through the Home Office and the then Home Secretary, were assuring us that they wanted us to succeed, that they applauded our efforts and were most reluctant to legislate in this area. They didn't want to be seen to be associated with statutory censorship. But with an election around the corner and the moralists still not satisfied, the industry could not be trusted to self-regulate. Mrs. Thatcher, I mean, very, very explicitly introduced into um, the Tory uh, election campaign the promise to do something about video nasties. Moral panics are very easy to whip up in this country. You just need a, a couple of newspapers uh, painting nightmare pictures of the effects on children and so on and so forth. And everybody's aghast and we all rush in. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I had moral panics on uh, violent dogs. And it's always in that situation, when there is a model panic on, uh, that bad legislation is passed because it's rushed through. You know, we must legislate this, stop it. Uh, and they rush it through so quickly they make mistakes. Mary Whitehouse was keen to find a candidate from within the House to champion the cause. And so Mary said to Graham Bright, well, you know, if you're elected, will you introduce a bill to, to deal with this problem? And so Graham Bright said publicly, yes, of course I will, Mrs Whitehouse. Some people think that they're very much like the sort of hammer horror movie that is sometimes shown on late night television. But of course that's not the case. We're talking about scenes that are really horrific and leave nothing to the imagination. Mutilations of bodies, cannibalism, gang rape. That is what a video nasty is. So of course the officials in the Home Office and the parliamentary draftsmen who were drawing up the bill later to become an act on behalf of Graham Bright 
who was really a puppet in all of this. I mean, it was a home office who was really doing this behind the scenes and using Graham Bright as a vehicle for getting this thing onto the statute book. My bill is aimed at protecting children because there is no doubt in my mind, having watched some of these, that we really must protect children from, from those things. And there's no doubt in the members' minds that came and watched that show yesterday. I believe that uh, a young person seeing that could have their minds scarred for life. Bright's beliefs on the dangerous effects of video violence mirrored those of Mary Whitehouse and the moralists. The parliamentary group video inquiry was set up to look into the viewing habits of the nation's children. Both ex-MP Graham Bright and research director Clifford Hill declined to be interviewed for this documentary. Research is taking place and it will show that these films not only affect young people, but I believe they affect adults as well. They asked me if I would direct a piece of research to discover the facts about what children actually are seeing in the home uh, that would enable parliaments to give a rational debate to this subject. I would rather not discuss some of the um, weapons that the moralists used in order to achieve their ends. Uh, I would be getting into areas of possible defamation if I were to say what I know. I would just say that I found the methods used and some of the tools that they used. I could understand their objectives and the purity of their motives but the means by which they achieved those objectives were, in my view, sometimes questionable. More than a third of all children under the age of seven have seen a video nasty. That's one of the findings in a study of video violence published today by a group of MPs, peers and churchmen. The, the, the first awareness I had of the, the research done by the so-called parliamentary group Video Inquiry is when there was a newspaper headline which said that four out of ten six-year-olds have seen a video nasty. Forty-five percent of children between the ages of seven and sixteen in schools throughout Britain have seen one or more of the so-called video nasty. And we managed to get hold of the, the questionnaire that was used in this survey. So the PGVE very kindly gave us the questionnaire. When we looked at it, we were appalled at the design. Do you know what a questionnaire is? No. Can you guess what a questionnaire is? The trouble was there were 113 film titles in their questionnaire and it went on over six pages. Now, that is a very long questionnaire. And while the questionnaire said at the beginning, if you have seen these films on video, please tell us what you think of them. Of course, by page two, the conditional, if you have seen, is quickly forgotten and kids go on to rate the film title whether they like the sound of it or not. So to demonstrate this, we went to, um, I think we had four classes in the end, of 11-year-olds, 11, 12-year-olds, 11, um, and we gave them the parliamentary group video uh, questionnaire with one important change. We took all of the uh, video nasty titles out and put in the titles of films that didn't exist. There were things like Blood on the Teeth of the Vampire, and we then substituted these film titles in the original questionnaire and gave it to 11 and 12-year-olds. Now, lo and behold, over two-thirds of kids claim to see films which don't exist. What's the Hospital of Horrors like? It's, it's, it's a bit scary. What sort of film is it? It's got, it's got, it's got a lot of blood in it. A lot of and, blood. Mm. Um, I can't say much about it, really. So we can see the claim that four out of ten children have seen video nasties has to be seen in the context that, in fact, the majority of children are going to say they've seen these films because they like the sound of them. I don't think that it's a, a valid test to, uh, to give them fake titles. Um, I think that is a, a dishonest way of um, carrying out a piece of research. I believe our method was much better. We became very concerned that this evidence uh, by the parliamentary group video inquiry um, was being used to push through a bill um, that seemed to be draconian in its, um, in its legislation. It doesn't seem believable, yet every day this is what scores of Britain's school children are up to. But there was such a momentum then uh, of government support behind the um, bright bill, so-called. The report itself certainly highlights that there is a very serious problem. 
Tonight, the parliamentary inquiry team said they were so worried about the effects of videos like these that they've called in several top psychiatrists to find out how much damage has already been done. The Bright Bill, if passed through Parliament, would ensure that videos released in Britain would have to be classified by a state-designated censor, who would have to give special consideration to the film being viewed in the home. Normally private members' bills disappear, 95% of them, nothing happens. But it was around Christmas that it became clear <clears throat> that the government was going to support this private member's bill. And as far as I was concerned, uh, my main motivation was not really to start getting involved in too many judgmental issues about you know, whether or not this material was damaging, but to provide a mechanism where experienced people, which would not include myself, would determine whether it was or whether it wasn't. Conservative members of parliament, because we're talking now of conservative government, were left under no doubt that they were expected to turn up and vote for it, even though it was a private member's bill. I can remember that Mrs Thatcher, the then Prime Minister, actually broke off discussions with the then Canadian Prime Minister, Mr Trudeau, which he was having at number 10, in order to come to the House and record her vote at one of the readings. The Prime Minister sat with other MPs in the Commons today to show the government's support for the new bill to clamp down on so-called video nasties. The bill's sponsor is now relieved that these measures seem certain to become law. Well, honestly, I'm absolutely delighted. I mean, the Prime Minister made it quite clear yesterday that she was behind the bill and that the government was behind the bill and that she wanted the bill to pass through the House as rapidly as possible. It was just worth nobody's while to oppose it uh, and nobody wanted to incur the odium of killing it uh, and the displeasure of Mrs Thatcher. Nobody really wanted to stand up and defend the video nasties because they were being so universally condemned as the cause of everything from air crashes to bad language in the playground. It's simple split between a you know, struggle of good and evil and these films are evil and therefore if you uh, don't agree with us that they should be banned then you're, you're self-evil. So it, it, it passed on a wave of pomposity basically with uh, None of the Liberal forces, not very strong at the time anyway, but none of the Liberal forces in Parliament doing anything about it. Uh, rubbish. Um, the reason the bill went through committee was because everyone was cooperating. Um, I never had to have a bill in the 11 years I was a minister guillotined. Uh, I believed in committee stages, not as a way for people to filibuster and use to abuse parliamentary process. And what we did was put in a practical mechanism where I wasn't deciding, Mary Whitehouse wasn't deciding, Mrs Thatcher wasn't deciding what people could see, but a group of people who rightly or wrongly were judged to be suitable to do that could make that determination about videos. The British Board of Film Censors were appointed by the government as the regulatory body to enforce the Video Recordings Act. The 18 category will still be Pretty liberal, in fact, more liberal than most countries in this world. Contrary to Mr Bright's assertions, over the next 15 years, Britain would be subjected to the strictest censorship in the Western world. Not surprisingly, horror films in particular suffered cuts and outright bans. Well, we had a, a catalogue of about 300 titles, which we had to withdraw, all of them, and re-release after having certificated, and that was a very, very expensive process. And I think it, you know, it, it seemed in some ways a little bit unfair that the small distributors had to pay as much as the big boys. A very, very big portion of uh, distributors and shops and the companies that actually had jumped on the bandwagon when the video started uh, had gone out because of the fact that they had to delete the whole catalogues. So on one hand, it was partly a censorship thing, but I think more importantly, it was how the majors wrested control again. OK, let's arrest some of them, let's, 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 get them, let's get them banged up, let's get them in court. So it was a way of suppressing, in many, in many respects, the importance of the independence. 21 years later, the BBFC are still in charge of what the British public can and cannot see. But in the last few years, many of the original nasties have been passed uncut while others are still outlawed in their unexpurgated form. With the advent of DVD and the internet, film fans can easily acquire their favourite nasties from foreign territories. Boxed originals of the DPP-39 have become collector's items, and some fetch hundreds of pounds on eBay. So I think it's ironic that The Evil Dead is now a collector's item, uh, with, with Sam Raimi directing it, and here we are now collecting this film. 
which 20 years ago I could have done two years had I been found guilty. Times have changed. It does look awfully silly now, but I would say that Mary Whitehouse and that group had every right to do exactly what they did if they were genuinely shocked by these films and genuinely thought they were harmful or immoral or likely to deprave and corrupt. But the other side should have flexed their muscles a bit more and said nonsense. We have been engaged in a battle, no less, for the whole quality of our culture, our faith, our democratic way of life. The days of video Nazis are gone. I'm still here, the public's still here, and they're still watching the same type of film. So Mary White asked, what did she really achieve? I don't know. I think her legacy is that broadcasters and the film industry are open much more now to question and to open much more to accountability, to being accountable for what they do. I think uh, um, the public were mugged, as it were, by this uh, um, orchestrated uh, uh, campaign to make us believe there was a, a problem when, in reality, um, those of us who investigated um, think it's uh, the evidence is very weak. I think the fact that the Video Recordings Act is on the statute book, is accepted, is because, you know, dare I say, self-praise is no recommendation, as my mother always said, but we actually made a sensible, objective, cool, analytical judgment. We were not part of the hysteria. In part two, we'll investigate how the British Board of Film Censors dictated what was and what was not acceptable viewing for the British public. James Furman, the head of the BBFC, loved to censor. And he could overrule, eventually, the, the rest of the members of the board. And how being the most censored nation in Europe is sometimes not enough. The media suddenly grabbed hold of this idea that the video industry was in some way responsible for the murder of James Bulger. <laughs> The British Board of Film Censors opened for business in 1912 and over the next six decades they would classify and cut all filmed entertainment intended for exhibition to British audiences. But by the late 70s cinema attendance was in decline and as a consequence the BBFC's income was at an all-time low. The board's relevance in the modern world will be further undermined by the advent of home video, which for a brief period had no formal censorship. In order to compete with the major studios, small distribution companies release films from around the globe, garishly packaged, films that were often quite salacious and would certainly never pass the censor for cinema exhibition, filled the shelves of video shops up and down the land. But this period of unmoderated home entertainment will be short-lived. Thanks to the tireless campaigning of media watchdog Mary Whitehouse, the national press and members of parliament, a new law was introduced onto the statute books to block the torrent of unclassified filth that was infiltrating our homes and corrupting our children. As the appointed body, under the terms of the Video Recordings Act, the British Board of Film Censors had to grant age-appropriate ratings to all videotapes intended for distribution. This government-granted monopoly would ensure that the BBFC were the only company on the planet guaranteed to make a profit from every video released in Britain. When the Video Recordings Act was being discussed, this was an ideal situation because you could set up a body that the government could turn around and say, well, censorship is now nothing to do with us. It's this body is going to have to look after it, which was a wonderful let out for the politicians. The whole problem was exacerbated by the fact that we had out on the market already before the enactment of the Video Recordings Act in 85, <clears throat> was that there were 10,000 videos already released onto the market and they all had to be classified as well. And the government gave us three years to get through 10,000 videos. So it really was a wonderful gift when the Video Recordings Act came in and uh, 
immediately large sums of money came in. Before this happened, before all the money from that came in, um, the BBFC was a pleasantly sort of sordid and hole in the wall, and suddenly the thing acquired a sort of corporate gloss. We would argue from time to time because they had to have their fees approved by the Home Office, and we would sometimes argue that they were um, exorbitant, that uh, they were incurring unnecessary expense and making over-elaborate changes to their offices and things like that, which then had to be passed on in the form of fees. The BBFC were now responsible for the acceptability of images being shown in the home. And thanks to the recent moral panics in the national press, they had to be cautious. The Act did not specify what it was the censors were supposed to concern themselves with. It only said in the original Act that they had to bear in mind the likelihood of the film being shown in the home. Now, I don't know what that means because the whole object of home video was that its product should be shown in the home. Quite a lot of homes don't have children at all. So the balance then was between guaranteeing the freedom of those adults. I think it was about a third of, of the households in the country don't have children. So they have rights too. We suggested strongly that it should say, by virtue of its treatment of sex, violence, drugs, blasphemy, da-da-da-da-da-da, and not just give him a carte blanche to censor whatever he thought fit. And the government said, no, we can't have what they call the laundry list approach. We have to trust the censor to use his common sense and judgment. Now, that's fine when the Home Secretary and his officials and the censors are sensible, responsible people. BBFC director James Furman was wary of the ways that the new technology could be used and abused in the home. You can't control the age of the audience in the home. You can advise and you can impose penalties on the shops if they supply to underage customers. But once it gets into the home, it's in the hands of the parents and some parents care and some don't. Also, some, some children are clever enough to outwit their parents. As the designated body, it was up to the censor to subjectively interpret the act. Pornography of violence is indulging in the physical process of uh, wounds and wounding and mutilation and torture. And again, for kicks, for voyeuristic interest. And that's, that's, that is the problem with them, that they don't encourage compassion, they encourage detachment and, and enjoyment. I think James did genuinely believe, at least to begin with, that he was kind of holding back the floodgates um, and you know, that we'd been allowed a glimpse of the, 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 the terrors that could happen if you had unregulated uh, video. And James saw it very much, I think, as his job to shut those uh, floodgates again. <laughs> Between 1986 and 1988, more than 10% of films submitted for video classification suffered cuts. James Furman loved to censor. He regarded himself as a film editor, and he loved to tinker with films. So when um, various video nasties were submitted for censorship, he loved to edit them. I don't think the public realized that he was not just certificating and labelling, he was cutting. And we were often shown these examples by James Furman, who was proud of what he'd been able to do and the skill with which he had exercised these cuts. Well, our standards are certainly stricter on video than they are on film. Video is, is very difficult because, uh, of course, the, the, the way you use it is totally in the hands of the user. I mean, you can, you can see things out of order, when we pass a film, we pass the film in context, as seen from beginning to end. But on video, you don't need to see things from beginning to end. You can uh, dip in here and there, and you know, you can you can action replays whenever you want, and you can change the meaning of it. If you gave the censor and encouraged him to concern himself with almost anything that's depicted in films, uh, you would find him deciding that all sorts of things should not be allowed. Although Furman never made public what he found objectionable, certain images would always end up on the cuts list. Instructional criminal behaviour, 
such as explicit drug use. Dangerous weaponry, such as throwing stars, butterfly knives or nunchakas. And, without exception, blood on naked female breasts. But how is it possible that the brave examiners could handle the dangerous imagery that the rest of the country was being protected from? Our examiners watch in a two-stage process. First, they must be open to the film or video, like the ordinary member of the audience, because they have to experience it as it will be experienced by the public. On the other hand, when there's a, anything they, they react to which seems to be a classification issue, they have to step back and analyze it. And so it's a, it's a double reaction. They're having the emotional reaction, and they're always analyzing that. They're watching themselves. They're what, watching the way their solar plexus reacts. You have to see it all again on the small screen, pretending to yourself that you're watching it at home. Um, I mean, <laughs> fairly ludicrous much of this, but, um, but that's what had to happen. They would be getting often rather good money for um, not spending very long on deciding that the you that they gave it on film should also apply on video. The subjective nature of the censorship process inevitably caused some heated debate within the board. And James Furman's opinions on that process would sometimes differ from the other members of the board. Well, James Furman was a very contradictory and rather ambiguous and I think very interesting figure. But yes, he certainly was autocratic. There's, there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that he was autocratic, evidence in particular from you know, examiners who have since uh, retired from the board. James Furman was very much in charge and he could overrule eventually the, the rest of the members of the board, but this didn't happen very all that often, I can assure you. Uh, particularly with these so-called Soho Six, are all university trained and so on. They were very vociferous in their comments about <laughs> how a film should be treated. So Jim, on the one hand, did love this. He liked and welcomed the idea of creating a forum for debate and discussion. But the other side of him, the much more authoritarian side, had always, I think, somewhere in the recesses of his mind, assumed that the net result of this discussion was one in which, you know, the forces of sanctified goodness, um, sanctified, that is, by Furman himself, would come to the right conclusion. ...in the privacy of their bed-sitting room and uh, freak out on them. And, uh, you know, it can feed the fantasy of rather disturbed people. You know, infamously, James thought of himself as a better feminist than, than many women. And I know that some of the female examined on the board found that um, very difficult to cope with. We had a great many films which treated rape as entertainment for a male audience, and his behavior that we believe will influence people to behave badly themselves. There are a few good reasons for even cutting things. Um, you should at least have the courage to make clear what those reasons, you know, what you think those reasons are, and open them to argument. And I don't think we were always very good at that. Put it mildly, we are bloody awful. The Video Recordings Act did not require the board to explain their reasons for a given decision to either the industry or the public. The climate in the industry in the wake of the video nasties scare was such that some distributors were cautious about what to stock and certain films would be cut prior to their submission to the BBFC. The censors also had an informal means of power over the film producer. If a film producer produced some controversial item and had a row with the British Board of Film Classification about what they wanted to do with it, either he didn't agree with the kind of certificate they were proposing to award, or he may be threatening to withhold certification altogether. So there would often be a row between the censors and the particular producer about what are you going to do, are you going to give it this, have I got to cut this out and all the rest of it. Now if the censor felt peeved by this, when that chap came along to have another film certificated, they would say, oh, how unfortunate. You wanted to bring this out in time for Wimbledon or Christmas or something. How, what a pity, because there's no way we'll be able to get through to it by that time, I'm afraid. We've got a three-month backlog. We're looking at Mary Poppins and we're looking at, you know, and of course, this put tremendous pressure on this producer not to have rows with the censors. 
and to bite his tongue and accept their decisions. It was a power that wasn't in the Video Recordings Act, but it very definitely operated and I was witness to it. I think for a while the, the business was pretty nervous. Um, a, a lot of stuff was being turned down at the time, uh, all what they considered to be the video nasties. None of those would get a certificate at that time. So we, we lost a, a large part of what was a very good renting product at the time. And so, and I think the quality of the films got even less then. I mean, if I seem to recollect that Evil Speak was cut by about 14 minutes or something stupid like that. It wasn't just the video nasties which suffered cuts. Many horror and adult films fell foul of the censor's scissors. In fact, sex films became quite chaste in the wake of the act, exposing less of the naked human body than the average top shelf magazine. I remember the very first one we, uh, we had cut from the BBFC. I remember the line great, uh, easily, like it was yesterday, removal site of thrusting buttocks. And, uh, and we all had a good laugh about that, so we removed the, uh, the throbbing bum on, on top of the woman and, uh, and then and put the movie out, wherever it was. I can't remember what it was, but uh, I just think you, you had to move with the times. That was the law. Some relatively mainstream films became personal targets for Furman and would not be granted a certificate, even though they'd been widely available and never banned in the pre-VRA years. Most notably, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Straw Dogs, and The Exorcist. James Furman insisted it was likely to be very harmful to young girls who saw it. And uh, when we did research on that, interestingly, uh, the, the, we had a group of people who'd not seen the film before. We call them Exorcist Virgins. And a group of people who'd seen it before when they were younger and looked at their responses to it. And the people who'd seen the film before thought it was much more frightening than the people who hadn't seen it before. So by today's standards, The Exorcist is not such a frightening film. I think he genuinely felt that it was uh, a very, very, very disturbing film for adolescents. And uh, he felt it would be harmful if, if they, were, they were to see it. I don't think he was right. <laughs> if a video didn't have a BBFC certificate, then the video shop owner or the distributor would be liable to a heavy fine. So those which didn't have BBFC certificates were now declared illegal. I mean, I think the Video Recordings Act has been, frankly, a bloody nuisance for, 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 for a long time. It stopped people at least easily seeing the films that they would, many people would like to be able to see. The only way to get video nasties like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Evil Dead after 1984 was on the black market. The outlaw status of violent horror and sex films spawned a healthy black market for uncertified videotapes. Fanzines, festivals and fairs would provide an arena for like-minded film fans to discuss and trade the forbidden fruits of the pre-cert era. I started advertising Dark Side with uh, a few of the main titles of, of Video Nasties to sort of grab people's attention. A big cross-section of people had, had right asking for films that they couldn't get hold of anywhere else. But you'd have some uh, really strange replies sometimes. Um, like they were written in blood and all sorts, all sorts, freaks, <laughs> some strange people. They wanted rare stuff, but they weren't prepared to risk importing it, so they, they'd bought off me. It's a safer bet. An 18 film will certainly have an adult theme and might well contain strong scenes of sex or violence, which could be quite graphic. It may also contain some very explicit language, which will frequently mean sexual swear words.
the video industry adapted to the new regime. But the dangers of video violence were never far from the tabloid headlines. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the film. On August the 19th, 1987, Michael Ryan took to the quiet streets of Hungerford, dressed in combat gear, armed with several firearms. 16 people, including Ryan's mother, were shot dead that afternoon, before Ryan turned a gun on himself. It wasn't long before the media started equating these horrific events with video violence. I don't happen to feel that what happened in Hungerford, and I don't happen to feel... It is feel disgraceful just what happened in Hungerford is as a result of, of violence on the screen. On Michael Ryan was dressed like Rambo. He well, nobody wanted... knows that he was dressed like Rambo. Can I just... You mentioned Death Wish. Now, Death Wish 3. An Did you a see body, it, Mary? A body fall, a shooting, every Can 90 seconds. Can I interrupt just for a moment? I'd like to get an independent view, if we may, from our television expert, Jimmy Greaves. Okay. When Kate Aidy did a panorama uh, special looking at um, cases where um, a film or a television programme had been claimed to uh, affect someone such they'd gone out and committed a crime, of the eight cases that were very clear cut, um, that they said there was supposed to be strong evidence for, none of them stood up to close scrutiny, including that of uh, Michael Ryan. So those dramatic uh, cases that get in the newspapers are singularly uninformative and uh, psychiatric evidence later on in, in, uh, in, in the cases hasn't helped very much either. In times of, you know, huge national stress, people naturally feel very, very upset about it and they want to blame somebody. And they don't want to know that maybe one of these killers was just, you know, not quite right in the head or whatever. They want to blame somebody. I think that's human nature. And uh, so who can they blame? And video is the obvious scapegoat. When the Video Recordings Act first came onto the statute books, I don't think the notion of harm was actually mentioned in the act itself. The notion of harm was lurking in the background in the BBFC's own guidelines and things. I think what happened was that the notion of harm became foregrounded and brought forward when the Video Recordings Act was amended in the wake of the murder of James Bulger. On February the 12th, 1993, two-year-old James Bulger was kidnapped from a shopping centre in Merseyside. His body was later found beaten to death on a train track two miles away. It turned out he'd been murdered by two 10-year-old boys. What initially coupled the Jamie Bulger case to the video scare was the footage of Jamie Bulger being led away from the shopping arcade by the two boys who eventually killed him. This was an image that reverberated amongst everybody. It was replayed constantly on the news. And as at the time was said, it enacted every mother's worst nightmare. The public were shocked by the case, and the media were quick to represent the national outrage. Shortly after I joined the British Video Association in November 93, um, the court case uh, was in train. And I recall that um, probably a few weeks after I joined, um, the media suddenly grabbed hold of this idea that the video industry was in some way responsible for the murder of James Bulger. In his summing up, Lord Justice Morland, the judge presiding over the case, made the following statement. How it came about that two mentally normal boys, aged 10, of average intelligence, committed this crime is hard for me to comprehend. It is not for me to pass judgment on their upbringings, but I suspect that exposure to violent films may in part be an explanation. When we heard Justin Morland comment, when I heard it on the news, I was gobsmacked. I was in the middle of drinking a cup of coffee and I nearly dropped it, um, because there had been nothing in the trial to suggest that the children had, in, in this 
terrible, terrible case, but that they had seen any videos. And of course, uh, in any case, him saying that meant that the packs of orbs would be on us again. That got the media absolutely running with this story, and they searched and searched for a potential um, title that was responsible. They alighted on the uh, Chucky video, the Child's Play 3, which was a, a paramount title, um, which nobody had commented on before this. Somehow or other, to bring video into that seemed very wrong to me. Uh, and so this face of a demonic doll, Chucky, appeared on the front page of the paper because there was, you know, and, and the juxtaposition of Chucky and his face and these the, the, the still pictures of these two little boys and the, this little victim was appalling. And at a time when I think probably public sensitivity was very high, um, seemed to me to be almost criminal. And I know that the police who interviewed the two boys um, said that they were not really influenced by child play because neither, I don't think either of them have, had seen that. But nevertheless, what those boys did to Jamie Bulger's body, um, you know, they could not have thought that up for themselves. They must have had been subject to some external influence to have thought up what they did. And I understand that in, in one of the boys' homes, um, you know, some of the really extreme videos were accessible to them, or to one of them anyway. Um, that, I think, is a fact. They were able to establish that the father of um, one of the, the, the boys, John Venables, had actually seen um, or rented Charles Play 3 um, some months before the, the, the murder. But since the son wasn't living at home at the time, and said that he really didn't like horror films, which was later um, shown by the psychiatric evidence. He dismissed it as a possibility and said it's extremely unlikely, therefore, that the film had got anything to do with the murder. The real question is there, why did Justice Morland feel himself able to make those comments? There's nothing in the case, really, to suggest that the videos played a role in it. But why did he feel that he could make those comments because there had been years and years and years and years of stories uh, in the press about the allegedly malign effects of videos. I'd like to know, for example, too, why it was when the police first began to investigate the families of the two boys who did kill James Bulger, why did they waste their time uh, going to the local video store? and finding out what the families had rented. What the hell does it matter? It seems to me an absurd and ridiculous waste of time. The media ran with a sensational story. Predictably, vote-hungry politicians followed suit. The new witch hunt was spearheaded by MP David Alton. The amendment seeks to introduce a new category of not suitable for home entertainment, and it will catch about 3% of the videos currently in pro being produced, the really ultra-violent videos, which are having such a damaging effect on young people. I mean, do you think that videos are a contributory factor towards that? Does it increase the level oh, of violence? Yes, of course. You, some children you see playing in the streets, and they're pretending to be um, not so much the gladiators, but People who've made us on films, you know, they don't play Donald Duck in the street, do they? It's all no. shooting and killing each other, and how... drugs. My sister, she's got three boys between seven and ten, and they say, Mum, can we go and get a video? Give her the card and they can come back with any tape they want to watch. And you think that should be, of course, against the law? Oh, yeah. David Alton, who was the MP for Liverpool, um, proposed a draconian piece of legislation to amend the Video Recordings Act, which would make it an offence to supply uh, videos which were unsuitable for family viewing or for children. So effectively that would have outlawed anything above PG. And my very modest measure seeks to sort out those like Child's Play 3, which contains graphic and gratuitous scenes which should not be available in anybody's home. And I think that it's quite wrong that we don't pillory the producers of this pornography, because most people who make movies like to be thought well of by society, and yet these people who make these horrible films are getting away with it and masquerading as being decent members of society. And I think the people who produce these things like 
these children murder things, which were tied up with a Bolger case, should also be publicly pilloried. But in the end... Alton had the backing of 80 Conservative MPs, and victory was well within reach. But at the 11th hour, he found himself confronted with an unlikely opponent. We cut more 18 videos for violence in this country than anywhere else in the world. There's no other country that cuts as many. I campaigned very hard against the David Alton Amendment because he garnered a lot of support from both sides of the House for an amendment that would have banned any video which might um, set a bad role model for a child or be psychologically disturbing to a child. And I pointed out that that would ban Schindler's List, um, which surely nobody, no sane person, wanted to do. If James Furman is seriously saying that he and the British Board of Film Classification can't tell the difference between Schindler's List or Toad in Toad Hall and something like Child's Play 3, then it makes you wonder uh, why, what they're doing in that job in the first place. It's Hollywood shockers like Child's Play that fuel the video nasty debate, but David Alton's hardline stance could hit much more. The sort of video that David Alton wants to ban, or see banned, is the crying game. Probably, I have to say, I go along with David Alton with reservations. The reservations such as the fact that you might be able to hire something like that chaplain. Absolutely. Yeah, no. Uh, David Alton's bill suggests that films which are of a classification, say, of 18 and which have violent material in it shouldn't be allowed to be rented at video stores. Now, it's not that I want to see all video shops like this closed. Indeed, there are many very fine videos which are on the market today, films like Schindler's List. But there are undoubtedly very many parents who share my concern about the levels of ultra-violent video material which are increasingly being made available in this country. David Alton privately commissioned a report about the dangerous effects of video violence on children to support his argument. Before the Alton Amendment was debated in Parliament, Elizabeth Newsom, a professor of sociology at Nottingham University, published a report about the links between screen imagery and children. In the case of the Newson report, which um, was, was launched on April the 1st, I uh, uh, would have thought that was an indication of, of really um, how it ought to be taken. Maybe it was a joke, but no, it wasn't. It was simply an assertion, well written, powerfully argued in its rhetoric, but contained very little by way of um, evidence or what considered to be part of scientific uh, debate. It's mainly newspaper clippings from uh, a lot from the, her local Nottingham newspaper. In fact, she hadn't done any research. Uh, what she had done was, um, I believe, to uh, look at a whole bunch of academic papers, mainly that came out of America, um, all surrounding media effects and this theory that um, if you watch uh, violence on the screen, your heart rate goes up, and therefore you are in danger of going out and committing a felony, um, murder, for example. And so we lobbied furiously, all of us, uh, with the uh, Video Standards Council and uh, the BBFC, I think, were heavily involved, just to make sure that um, politicians understood that um, the implications of what David Alton was proposing, but also that they understood that the UK is already the most strictly regulated video uh, industry in the free world, and uh, it really wasn't necessary to go this far. In the big debate on the Alton Amendment, the word freedom was never mentioned. The only person that week that was using the word freedom was, was me in all the articles I was writing in the, in the press and on radio interviews, because I was on The World this weekend and Sky News discussion program on that Sunday trying to kill that amendment. And it was ridiculous that the censor was the one who was talking about freedom. Fortunately, the leaders on both sides of the House, Michael Howard, who was then Home Secretary, and Tony Blair, who was at that time opposition spokesman, they, they took up this point that I had made. The key thing is to find a way through to prevent extreme violent, uh, gratuitously violent videos finding their way into people's homes, and yet ensuring at the same time that we don't, by casting the net so wide, end up preventing people watching films like Schindler's List, which are plainly decent films. Despite strong support within the House, the Home Secretary rejected the Alton Amendment. 
in the 24 hours before an amendment is being debated, which is likely to be successful, a certain amount of black propaganda gets put about. I've been always satisfied that the amendment would achieve its objective of catching the 3% of ultra-violent videos which I had in my sights. But the Home Secretary wants to redraft and put it in his own words to achieve precisely the same objectives. I don't quarrel with that. If we'd had the Alton Amendment, that the industry would have been crushed and it would have been impossible for film makers, whether in Hollywood or anywhere else in the world, Hollywood, Bollywood, UK, they couldn't have uh, made any profit at all out of movies because, as everybody knows, most, most of the income from uh, a film is derived from the, the video exploitation. Dealers who flout these provisions by supplying videos to underage children or videos which haven't been classified at all face stringent penalties. The video industry is going to have to pay greater heed to the concerns of the public and the board is going to have to not be afraid to be stricter. Amendments were made to the Video Recordings Act. Supply of an unclassified work now carried a penalty of up to two years imprisonment and a fine of £20,000. Supply of a classified work to an underage person now carried a penalty of up to six months imprisonment. So that's very, very stringent penalties for that. And one has to question whether they were, they were fair in a way. I think we, whether they were just. Um, an unclassified video, two years in prison, seems a lot, doesn't it? In the wake of the, the Bulger case, the Newson report, the Alton Amendment, and the um, apparent tightening up of the uh, Video Recordings Act, because all of these things had put the question of so-called video nasties firmly back on the agenda, uh, certain police forces in certain areas began getting busy again and um, raiding video shops and uh, video dealers um, for so-called uh, video nasties. But I mean, I think apart from that, one of the most shocking things that's, that's happened over the years is the way in which the police, aided and abetted by training standards officers too, have frequently raided the homes of video collectors who have just been swapping videos um, amongst themselves. You know, if I was to give you um, a video, that apparently counts as distribution. And this has given these people, police and the, the training science officers, carte blanche to batter down people's uh, doors, seize their video collection, seize their recorders, have them up in court, uh, you know, all accompanied by ghastly stories in the uh, local papers about these evil perverts. I was at home. Um... There was a knock on the door, and uh, there was two training standards officers there uh, and a police officer. They had a, a, ro a warrant to search the premises, and the training standards officers were walking around like they'd, they'd just sort of hit heaven. They were just chucking the stuff into evidence bags, um, my video recorders, videotapes, everything video-related. They took all, all my certified videos as well. Uh, they took home videos that I had, uh, family videos. It then went to court and there was three tapes that was actually given specimen charges for. They were drill a killer, faces of death and violent shit too. I think they were just going for those titles because of the shock value and the media coverage about them. They sort of sensationalised it. Even in the court they seemed to where uh, the judge was saying like they they take a very dim view on uh, the fact that I was selling films with uh, real-life deaths in them, such as Driller Killer, um, they actually said that in the court, which I laughed at and I was uh, told off for that. They were trying to make an example of me, um, which I was really not too pleased about. Well, I suppose it's um, one of those disastrous routes one can go down that, uh, in the end, the only thing to do is bring back hanging uh, for possession of an unclassified video. For the remainder of the 90s, stories would continue to appear in the press, equating video violence with the breakdown of society. James Furman would occasionally stand up for the rights of the country's viewers. In 1998, this move prompted his retirement 
but also led to the partial legalization of hardcore videos for sale in licensed adult shops. Nevertheless, than the rest of Europe. Robin Duval took over as director of the BBFC in 1998. Within a year, both the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Exorcist were legally available in Britain for the first time in 15 years. Straw Dogs followed in 2002. In fact, numerous films which had suffered cuts or bans under Furman were released with neither copycat criminal behaviour nor a tabloid frenzy. What a change in the British public that made these images safe to view just a few years on. Still attracts the attention of the censors and often requires cuts. But now at least the board is more open and gives legal reasons for their decisions to the distributor. In 2005, only 4% of films classified for home video were cut. Could it be that the notion of the violent video threatening our society will become a bizarre footnote in recent British history? Values are shifting. And I think that that, that, that that is also the case. People are becoming more senilliterate, which I think helps. Um, it's more difficult, I think, to, to, to whip up these kinds of, of campaigns. It becomes increasingly hard to understand that as time goes on. And we now have 24-hour pornography available at the touch of the button on the internet and everything else it seems kind of almost innocently silly. It's difficult to know why we're different in Britain. Um, I mean, it's one of the things that I've been asking in focus groups, you know, it's the liberal-minded and the conservatives say, well, well, we're British and, and you know, I can't explain it, but, you know, basically, that's how we are. I think it is a quintessentially British problem. I think it, it, it gathers together a lot of things which are unattractive about British life, actually, I should say English life, really. The class structure, the horrendously uh, prurient and populist press, which we have over here. Politicians who seem to be wildly out of touch with many aspects of, of modern life. An awful kind of busybody, bossy boots tendency, which I find deeply unpleasant. Tight shoes is a mother. Have you ever had tight shoes? I'm a nightmare walking, psychopath talking. King of the jungle like a gangster stalking. Living life like a firecracker, quick as a fuse.